Uh, well, uh, welcome to the uh, Scale Model World podcast with uh, your co-host, uh, David Howell of Toro Models and Wayne Green of World of Wayne. Hi, Wayne. Hello, everybody. How are you? The Scale Model World podcast. Well, um, again, this podcast is um, really a, a series for, for all model makers. Um, it's a series where you can build part works, plastic kits, and everything in between. Um, it's really a podcast for, for all model makers. Um, and of course, don't forget to get in touch. Uh, I do say this every episode, and uh, very few of you do. Uh, but if you have a burning question or you'd like to get in touch with us, uh, please do. Um, there's lots of uh, email addresses all over our websites and stores. So please do uh, do come back to us if you have any uh, have any queries or any questions, and we will endeavour to to respond to those uh, in a future future episode. Now, um, quite a bit to get through, I think, uh, uh, for this one, because uh, obviously uh, we're recording this uh, after uh, Scam Model World at uh, Telford, uh, which uh, we were both uh, both at. Uh, I must say, for, for me, uh, it was um, kind of bonkers, really. Uh, it's it's the usual uh, craziness, uh, which which is uh, Scam Model World. Um, but I, I thoroughly enjoyed every single second. Uh, but of course, for, for you, Wayne, you, you, were, you were there for a very short time um, and you did cr- try to cram it as much as you could with uh, with a couple of special guests. I certainly did. Obviously, uh, Phil Siegel from Spruverse and Lou Dal Meso, you're going to hear later on. He uh, they they came over from the US to experience Telford, and uh, <laughs> Telford lived up to its reputation. Walking in there, I mean, when we got there, we got there between eleven and twelve, yeah. so the queues had gone, so we could yeah, yeah, walk yeah. straight in. But you could see the carnage that was there beforehand, <laughs> and then just seeing that initial yes. hall, because I thought you walk into wall uh, hall one, but you don't. You walk into hall three, yeah. and then you've got two ones. There's three halls. Uh, and even hall three was absolutely rammed yeah. Yeah. now we wanted to offload our stuff to a guy called keith who runs uh, cosmic scale models so we're not carrying coats and bags around uh-huh. sure. it took us about an hour to get to him because <laughs> not only were we just trying to look and push through the crowds but obviously people are saying hello and we were just talking yeah, to yeah. everybody and at the end of the day we can only stay to about three o'clock uh-huh. and um we just we, we just I, I spent more day, more time meeting people, looking at models and chatting to people than actually looking around the venue. <laughs> so it's definitely a two-day thing. <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. And um, it, I, I got the distinct impression. It, it was also because uh, it's the uh, 60th anniversary. Um, you know, this is uh, uh, the 60th time they've done this. And I think that was a, a, an additional draw. Um, IPMS hasn't obviously released the, the numbers yet for how many people are actually attended, but it's well up on, I think, on the previous year. Um, because I, I, I mean, obviously, I was in there early um, as uh, as one of the uh, one of the dealers. But uh, someone said the other queue was snaking all the way back to the car parks, um, wow. which was just crazy. Uh, and that was on the Saturday because that tends to be the, the busiest day. But um, yeah, the halls were um, absolutely heaving, and they, they really were. Um, and also, of course, I think a lot of um, I think a lot of the overseas traders were back this year. Yeah, more, they were. At least, yeah, at least a few more than uh, than uh, we had previously, which is really good to see that they've come back mm-hmm. to uh, to support uh, to support the show. Um, but of course, Telford was part of your trek around the UK, uh, which we've been um, uh, sort of uh, uh, been privy to on your uh, on your channel. So Telford was just literally the the, the kickoff, really, for um, for quite a uh, an interesting trek around sort of London uh, for you know, for Comic Con, and uh, I think you also went to the the film and TV um, uh, museum, and um, you even had time to stop at a, a stop off at uh, Stonehenge. Yeah, um, well, that's the first thing we did. I picked up Blue and Phil from the airport, and obviously, I wanted to keep them awake. Yeah, and Stonehenge is only like an hour fifteen minutes yeah. from, from yeah. Heathrow, so Absolutely. we went straight to Stonehenge, which was crazy. <laughs> and it was it was solid rain until we got to Amesbury. Yeah. And it was just blue skies. I've never been to Stonehenge when there's been wow. blue skies. So yeah. I got loads of pictures, and I, I, I did feel like I was in a window screensaver. <laughs> <laughs> but, but then from Stonehenge, we went back to London, and we actually visited the model shop Hannant's, which is yes. by the RAF Hendon Museum. Yes, so is. very primarily military models, which is yeah, makes sense being next to a, 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 an RAF museum. Absolutely. And then from Hannant's, we drove to Covent Garden, where I had to park because there was no trains running the next day because yes. of uh, they had the London marches on and I yeah, think yeah, they were yeah. doing signal works on five yeah. different lines. Yeah. So uh, parking in Covent Garden and driving in London, which was my first time, was pretty stressful. <laughs> oh, but yeah, it's very hairy. Uh, you pick the you pick the right weekend. Uh, yeah. All those demonstrations, etc. Uh, that's. Uh, but well, that's we left. A... We left from seven o'clock in the morning, so we didn't get to see any of it. So we we travelled straight from Covent Garden to Rugby, 
where we stayed at a service station. And I was telling you earlier that um, uh, Phil and Lou had never experienced a British service yes. station, which yes. they thought was such a novelty. It's like a shopping mall on the road. And then from rugby, oh. obviously, we got to Telford. We got to Telford just after 11, and yeah. it was so busy that we had to park in the Asda, which was a good, I don't know, uh, I'd say a quarter to half a mile away. Yeah, good quarter of a mile. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, easy. But, um, but, easy. Uh, yeah, it was rammed. It was rammed. <laughs> yes, uh, I think uh, if if you if anyone listening to this hasn't been, uh, then you know you really must put it on your calendar. Um, it, it's it, it really is uh, you know the mecca for you know, for, for, for for scale modelling. Um, but interestingly, uh, of course, it's not just uh, just plastic kits. Uh, our friends at Agora were there. Uh, had a very interesting stand. Um, well, that I, um... was that was part of the reason why I didn't get anything done in the first hour because wow. while I was making my way to a hall three, a yeah. models was in hall two, yeah, yeah. and I went straight to their stand to say hello. And of course, once again, my eyes just went straight to that Apache helicopter, <laughs> and I'm yeah. like, "It's the longbow, isn't it?" And I'm it like, is, yeah, "Wow, indeed. where did that come from?" Oh, so, so uh... well, well, James did hint at that. I asked, him, "Well, has the new thing got four wheels?" Uh, he said, "No, it hasn't." Uh, so I was racking my brain, "What hasn't got four wheels?" Uh, and I must admit, helicopters never entered my mind. No, it was impressive though. Did you did you see it? Yeah, yeah amazing, yeah. absolutely amazing. Um, it, it was it was great to talk to them all, um, and also the, the the feedback they were getting. Um, I think maybe they were a little bit apprehensive. You know, what kind of reaction were we going to get? Um, but actually, in the end, it was fantastic. Um, they got very positive reaction to uh, to everyone in that hall uh, because it, it's a kit. It's you know, it yeah. is still model making uh, in. Uh, you know, whatever definition you want to use uh-huh. um which is really gratifying i think it gives people a um uh, an option to uh, to build something different um and you know it's there and of course the the uh, the amount of different kinds of kits they put on show was uh, was amazing i think they pretty much bought everything yeah. um which uh, which which <laughs> it's is, a shame uh, they didn't have the optimus prime there because lou wanted yeah. to see the optimus prime but the um i did ask um liam about the release date for that i think that's going to be later next year probably yeah. in the late summer something like that and that's coming out um now you're also uh, at uh, at Airfix's uh, visitor center, which yeah. uh, which they opened, which uh, I, I have seen a video, and um, that does look a very nice day out. I must admit, it's, it's certainly well, on my well, uh, on my list. I um obviously we uh, after Telford we came back, we went to London. I had to drive back to Corby, and I thought, you know what, I'm not driving anymore. So <laughs> so I didn't realise that I live in Corby. Corby is actually on the St Pancras line, yep. and Margate's on the St Pancras uh, line. So all right. I had to do was get off at uh, St Pancras, change platforms, and go to Margate. So it's really? a lovely trip. It's only an hour and a half from St Pancras, Excellent. and then the Wonderworks, which yeah, is yeah. the the Hobby Hobby Centre. That's about a six minute cab ride away. Wow. So uh, it's it's not far at all. I think it's yeah, about it's... three or four miles. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I met Ollie uh, Oliver Rayburn. He likes to be called Ollie Ollie Rayburn. Uh, he's new to the company. He's okay. came from Paper Chase, uh, oh, but he yeah, did yeah, yeah. impress on us the vision that he's got for Hobby Hobbies. And I did say to him, uh, I used to work in retail and PC mm. World, and I'm wondering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got all these different brands. Would you yep. want to see these brands going under one umbrella, like Hornby mm. Hobbies, Scale Electric, Hornby Hobbies, Airfix, Hornby? Mm. But no, he's got the complete opposite. He wants to branch these out into their own separate entities and keep them that way. So okay. Scale Electrics will have their own uh, like hierarchy and people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Airfix, yep. they'll have their own hierarchy yep. and promote the brands as single entities, which I thought was brilliant. But in Wonderworks, they do amalgamate everything together, yes. not just in the shop. But yeah. in the sort of museum exhibition that they've got as well, Very and it's cool. brilliant because not only is there interactive things to do in that museum, but there are um, displays showing you exactly how models are made, right from mm. the blueprints to yep. the prototypes to the yep. end model, and they do that for Corgi, Scalectrics, yeah. every yeah, yeah. single brand, which is absolutely really? brilliant. And they did have the original Great Escape Triumph motorcycle there. Yes. That's only on loan, so I only think that's going to be there oh, for right. a couple of months from oh, the right. Leicestershire Triumph Museum. They had the yeah, original. Yeah. No Time to Die Triumph that wow. um, uh, Daniel Craig rode yeah, yeah. in the film. That was there as well. Um, but that whole experience, I mean, I mm. was there for a good couple of hours looking around. It's only £5 for adults, £2.50 for kids, it's which I'm good. like, God, if you're a Margate, you do need to pay that a pilgrimage, I think. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Um, I, I, I do like the idea that um, um, I guess the the investment and the, the vision for, for each brand will be you know, self-contained. Um, I do like that. I think it, it will give, I guess, each uh, each sort of uh, avenue for them. Um, I guess their own, um, you know, their own path because it is different. Uh, yeah. You know, the the, you know, the Hornby guys um, are not the same as the Scale Street guys. They aren't. Uh, mm-hmm. It's a very different kind of, of marketplace. Even though there may be some crossover there, mm-hmm. and I'm sure it is. I'm sure there are people out there um, have, uh, you know, uh, they they are absolutely interested in trains. They have Scale Electric kits. They build plastic models, and they collect Corgi, uh, you know, Corgi die cards. I'm sure mm-hmm. there's plenty of those people. But if if one thing is just your passion. 
um, I think that's great that they're going to make the uh, make the investment. Yeah, definitely. But I loved it. I said it was uh, it was something yeah. that I, I I've always wanted to go down there just yeah, to yeah, actually yeah. meet the folks there because I do see yeah. them on press days and stuff. But yeah. this one was just a chance to have a look around this. It's only just been completed, um, yes. but there were people there because it was just a press day for a couple of hours on the Tuesday morning waiting uh, right. to go in. So right, right. and this was chucking it down the rain. There was another <laughs> storm Debbie or something coming in, but yes, uh, it was the, it was the ideal thing to actually uh, you know do while I was in Margate sort of thing. So uh, so it is. It's it's absolutely on my uh, my list of uh, my list of things to do. Uh, now, I was looking at uh, um, what sort of happened in the sort of plastic model world, um, and um, there's a couple of interesting things, actually. Um, I mean, I do, a, I do a wide range of different kinds of plastic kits, uh, uh, particularly a lot of armor as well. And um, the, the thing that stood, stood out for me, um, Meng, I seem to have this, this, this sort of tiger tank obsession. Uh, mm-hmm. You get sort of, they come along like buzzies. Uh, <laughs> you, get, you get sort of you know, two or three uh, instantly. So that's that's a very interesting thing uh, for me. But interestingly enough, um, they are also doing a um, an F1 kit, um, the 1988 uh, McLaren in, in 112. Yeah. But the interesting thing is, I didn't know this existed uh, until this morning. Um, it's pre-painted. Oh, Wow. Right, so it's a plastic kit, yeah. uh, but the paint finish is complete. All the decals are on, wow. so it is very much like a part work. Uh, but you don't assemble it with a screwdriver. Oh, that's interesting. You you got to still get out your craft knife and your yeah. all, you know your extra thin and all the rest of it. But it's pre painted. Um, wow. So if if painting is not your forte, um, yeah. you still want to build an F one car, and uh, maybe you've had some experience with the part work. These kind of kits could be uh, could be kind of up your street. Um, I've had a look at the pre uh, uh, pre release uh, images, and they do look amazing. Wow! Um, it's it's a very interesting, I guess, m- amalgamation of two things there. Uh-huh. Um, because initially, I thought oh, it, it's like a part work, but it's, it's a, but it's a plastic kit, um, which is very interesting. So um, I'm going to be very uh, very keen to get hold of one of those and just see what, yeah. it, what it feels like. Uh, when Where did you see that? Uh, I look at all the the news uh, the news that's coming out and main wow. release all this stuff. There's stuff on the on the uh, on the website now. Um, but I didn't know they existed. Apparently, there's a few of these. I think they're called pre-coloured kits. Wow! Um, but the paint finish uh, is uh, is immaculate. It really is. But it's still plastic. It's still a plastic kit. I it's think the the only one I've ever had like that was I did the Pegasus Hobbies War Machine from War of the Worlds, mm, yeah. and that was the one that was already bronzed. But you right. didn't have to paint that. Everything yeah. was coloured for yeah. you to just piece. Well, I suppose it comes it. off uh, the the Gundam um, uh, world because a yeah. lot of that is all pre-coloured. Uh, yeah. You know, it snaps together and um, that's cut and it's finished. Obviously, the, some of the Japanese guys go bonkers with the with the paint finishes and the decals, <laughs> um, uh, but you you know you don't have to. You can still get a very very good model, uh, but it's all pre coloured. So I, I think that's kind of where it comes from. But I've never seen that. I think they do with bikes and uh, more um, sort of car kits, but I've never seen yeah. uh, a one twelve. Um, wow. so yeah. Never built a one twelve. Um, so that might be an interesting uh, way to get into that. Do do a one twelve, but do one of these sort of pre coloured and see what it feels like. That you don't have to paint it. I don't yeah. have to get my airbrush out, which uh, either I'll find liberating or I'll be a bit, I'm caught, I really want to paint that. Uh, and you can still you still do that, of course. You can still paint the thing if you feel the, the paint finish is not for you. Um, yeah. But uh, if uh, if painting isn't your forte, uh, then uh, these kits could be could be very, very, uh, very interesting. Definitely. Uh, now, um, we've come to the sort of the point where uh, I usually uh, um, um, come to uh, any questions that people have sent in. I say at the beginning, I said, do people send, uh, do send questions? As luck would have it, someone has. Um, it's, it's off the back of uh, the last episode's um, uh, interview with, uh, with James over at, at Agora. Um, we've had a couple of questions from uh, Rick, uh, Rick Gregory. Um, uh, the first question he asked is, is basically about licensing. Um, uh, you know, how difficult was it to, to get licenses? You know, why is the UK, for instance, allowed to, to build uh, a US car, but the US car maybe is not available uh, for yeah for us and so on? Uh, you know, the, the I guess territories. I think that we're still yeah. talking about. Um, well, certainly, I sent a few questions off to off to James, and uh, for, for the licensing, um, Agora is, I guess, a little bit uh, maybe unique. Um, what they tend to do, uh, he says, is is look at the whole thing on a sort of global level. Um, I think they they look at the uh, the model they'd like to uh, to bring to marketplace, and if they can't do it as a global uh, license, maybe they wouldn't do it because right. they, don't, they they want to offer it to to everyone because that's kind of part of the Agora promise, isn't it? That wherever you are, you can build this thing. Um, yeah. You know, there's there's no there's no issue there. So I, I think uh, for for, uh, for to, to answer that, Rick, it's it's really a case of I, I guess how the company approaches the licensing and what they want to do with that. 
um, and obviously which territories they want to want to attack. But for but for Agora, it's a case of well, the entire world. Yeah, you know, we want to be <laughs> we want to be everywhere, uh, yeah. which which is fantastic uh, because you've often uh, had that on your channel. A great deal of people saying, well, why can't I get that card in my country? And why can't I buy uh, you know this part work in in my territory? Yeah, you know, I'd really like to build that. And I can't, uh, which yeah. is, which is a pain. Um, I could import it with some of these companies that uh, help us do that, but of course that that increases the cost in some cases quite hugely to, to get hold of these kits. Um, so I think it's, I think for for, uh, for I guess the response, uh, Rick, is really that it's 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 kind of up to the companies to to get the best uh, best licenses they possibly uh, possibly can. Mm-hmm. Now, Rick also asks a, a very interesting one. Actually, uh, he says, "Why is it that we have to remove or assemble a part? For example, we attach a wheel, but later on in the build, we have to remove it a couple of times before we put something else onto onto the car." Um, uh, James uh, James says, uh, "Well, we do try to minimise this, but there also are also some reasons uh, for this. Uh, the first one is that parts tend to uh, to be safer." Um, if they mm-hmm. they are added and the construction rather than stored separately, so it's it's better to put it on the car so we don't lose them. Tell we, me about it. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, how many times uh, I put something down and I go, "Where's that gone? Where's that yeah. spring? Where I'm sure I put that spring on my bench there. Where has that spring gone? Um, how many times I've done that? You, you I've lost track. Uh, yeah. Of course, well, plastic modelers, you ping stuff off sprues and it's gone. Uh, where's that gone? Um, I'm hunting around under my desk daily looking for parts so i think that's a very good point that we attach this stuff and just so we don't lose it um he also says by adding uh, items like wheels uh, the modeler gets a better feel uh, for the progress and how the model is going to look which i think mm-hmm. is a very good point because um often uh, maybe if you just left it as a chassis yeah. it'd be a chassis for for well months wouldn't it and you yeah, don't feel pro- you don't feel you're progressing and I uh-huh. think that's a that's a very uh, that's a very good point. Um, and also, uh, sometimes it's a response to to customer feedback. Uh, apparently, uh, the better way of constructing the, the kit is to remove a part that's easier than trying to remove it later on. Uh, so yeah. they've they've sort of thought that through, uh, which I think yeah. is um, is a, is a I, I guess makes the whole process for yeah for us for us model makers um, really uh, uh, I guess a better experience because we do not want to be pulling our hair out if we had any. <laughs> uh, but, th- but there you go. Um, Rick also asks, um, um, why do we preassemble parts uh, not until later on, or do we get near to the build, um, such as pack one? We assemble the grill or a hood or maybe a wheel, and we don't need those until months later. Uh, you know, what is pack one, the start of something when really uh, for a car, it could be really that part is much, much later on. Um, now, James makes the interesting point that he says, overall, we do follow the construction signals of the real car, interestingly enough. Um, mm-hmm. That's the, you know, the chassis the engine first and the interior cabin and finally the bodywork. However, we also uh, need to make the build as enjoyable as possible. Again, that's that experience of building these things. Um, yeah. We separate the parts uh, to be uh, to more interesting. For example, we, we do not give uh, all four wheels in the same pack. But we spread them out. So it may be a little less interesting to have a pack four with just four wheels in it, which, which is which is a fair point. Um, I was thinking, can you imagine four wheels of the DB5 in one pack? In pack. You'll be there all day doing uh, those folks. <laughs> well, again, it's that experience. I mean, that's a very good point. I think the feedback, maybe that's exactly the kind of feedback they got, was that mm-hmm. we don't want to do this because it's it's soul-destroying to do four in a row. <laughs> Uh, but you've, you you kind of said that little bit with um, arms and legs. Oh, we've got to do yeah. another arm. Uh, yeah. Or the X-wing, we've got to do four at four wings. Um, <laughs> so exactly the same thing, four times. Um, mm-hmm. so, and that's why it's kind of spread out. So you, you don't have to do that uh, sort of four uh, four times. Um, because they, they believe it's uh, it's sort of uh, important to give some um, identifiability. Or, uh, to, you, so you can identify the body parts, like a hood, like a grill or a door in the first pack. Models can see the exact paint colors and finish straight away. But also yeah. appreciate the size of the model, which I think is uh, is also interesting. Um, uh-huh. and, and the last question from uh, from Rick is, um, will they ever discontinue a build? Um, you know, we've had conversations about this a lot. Companies come and go. Um, but of course, for for Agora, that's uh, absolutely built into into their, um, I guess, into their their mantra that if we if we go to build a car, it's it's you know, it's absolutely uh, going to be uh, uh, going to be completed. Um, yeah, that kind of thing, I think, is um, maybe something of anxiety is still in the marketplace. I think that's I think that's that's true. Um, but I think with with companies like uh, you know like Agora and uh, and others. I think they've kind of learned their lesson that if we're going to do this, mm-hmm. we are we are absolutely going to make the commitment to uh, to, to complete the model because yeah. no one wants a half finished model. 
Um, no, definitely. Yeah, that's it's all part of their Agora promise. That's what yeah. they, they 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 promise on that. So I think I think another uh, um, reading into what Rick's asked a question there. I, I, I'm wondering if he means that have you got a model which eventually people won't be able to get anymore? So uh, the people that mm. are subscribed will get the end model, but it will then become moratorium and it won't go. I think I've asked James this uh, quite a while mm. ago, and he said, uh, for example, like the Cobra. Yeah, that's yeah. always going to be there, but when it's not there. And it's all that. Don't be surprised if it comes back, but this time it's a red one rather than a yes, blue one indeed. or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but the, you're absolutely right. The Agora promise, they will make sure it's completed for out. Yes, because uh, he also mentions uh, uh, things like limited editions, yeah. which absolutely, when they're gone, they're gone because it's a limited edition. So yeah. absolutely. So you know, if you if you want uh, one of those, uh, then uh, well, you're gonna be very quick uh, because they do tend to sell it very very quickly with the, uh, the special editions or the uh, limited edition ones. Um, yeah. But I think ongoing builds, yeah. Uh, I think things like uh, like Super Snake, etc. That's obviously we don't know, um, but I would imagine you know that's part of a, a catalogue which will be um, evergreen, I guess, yeah. uh, as we go forward, um, mm-hmm. and probably eventually uh, will become full kits. I think that's that's yeah. uh, that's kind of where the market's moving to as well. I think um, that, yeah. that kind of uh, that kind of thing. If you are looking to take the detail and accuracy of your models to the next level, Mike Lane Mods has a range of mods and accessories to choose from. Mike is a builder himself, subscribing to the original Eagle Moss build of the DeLorean, Mike could instantly see where improvements could be made. As other builders started to ask Mike to make the mods for their models, Mike Lane's Mods was born. Mike's creativity, attention to detail and enthusiasm for big scale modelling means each mod is carefully researched and then produced by hand so you can be sure that each mod is perfect. Created with a range of high quality materials, Mike's mods often replace or add essential details to each model he supports across his growing range. Whether you want screen accurate carpets for your DeLorean, a motorized roof box for the Ecto-1 or a fully working electronic dashboard for your K2000 kit, Mike has a mod for your model. Find out how you can enhance your models with Mike's latest mods by visiting MikeLaneMods.com. Well, uh, now we've come to um, the the time for our uh, very special guest. Um, now, many of you um, may have already met him, at, uh, at <laughs> and certainly know him um, as a sort of model maker extraordinaire. Um, and and uh, that person is uh, none other than uh, Lou Delmesa, uh, who you may know as uh, Aztec Turk Dummy. Well, uh, welcome, Lou. Hi, Lou. Hello, hello. I'm I'm waving, realizing this is a podcast. A podcast yeah. <laughs> yeah. Waving does nothing. <laughs> if you're wondering, wondering why uh, we, we're actually recording this, obviously a, a few days or weeks ago, and we we're recording the video and the audio, uh, we're actually sat here looking at each other. But obviously, you guys can only hear us. Uh, so uh, basically, lose uh, waving at an empty screen, which is quite funny in itself. But there you go. <laughs> um, so, so Lou, again, uh, thanks for for joining us uh, today on the on the podcast. Um, we wanted to sort of get you on um, because, um, well. Well, you're somewhat of a celebrity, I think, in the uh, in the sort of uh, in, in the model making uh, um, uh, world. I think, and you know, the environment we all sort of uh, live in. A um, couple of things to kick off, really, I suppose, is uh, I guess where it all came from. Um, are you just like uh, Wayne and I? Uh, you did this when you were younger. Did you come back to the hobby? Have you continued it all the way through your your sort of adulthood? How did you, uh, I guess, arrive at uh, you know the, uh, the the kind of model making you do uh, at the moment? Um, is it a journey, or did you come back to it after after a break? Oh, I took a big gap for a while. Mm-hmm. I was I, I built models in the uh, six. Um, I'm one of those old folks. I I was back in a day when we didn't get really good models, but I built models. Uh, through the 60s and 70s and you know early 80s and then took went to art school came back got a job grew up you know got a government job that kind of stuff and then it was really around 2003 2004 when i came back into it big time i built the odd model here and there in in the meantime sure. but uh it was like the one two punch of the 350 scale nx01 and then right after that the 350 scale refit when those two models came out so close together it's like uh this is a good time to be to get back into modeling so that's when i jumped back in so to speak did you originally start with um your sci-fi fantasy movie sort of genre or did you have kit models which were like you know your aircraft your military or has it always been themed it's always been fantasy models Hmm. it's always been now I'll build a car if it's Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, or I'll build a car if it's the Batmobile, but I'm not going to build a 56 Chevy. Where I grew up, I could see 56 Chevys. I, you know, I go down the street, there's one there. Or 
you know, not necessarily every military craft, but if there was a real you know, thing, like I could go see it, I couldn't see the Starship Enterprise. Yeah. So I wanted to have, you know, a Starship Enterprise or a Batmobile or you name it. Uh, um, back then, it wasn't so much the uh, figure kits, although I did have the full set of the uh, Adair Planet of the Apes mm, kits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it, but uh, it was generally it was generally fantastical things. Not so much the Frankenstein Dracula monsters, but more the fantasy robots and. Uh, so, do you find you've got more comfort doing the figurines or the spaceships? Uh, I used to say spaceships. Uh, I because for the longest time I had you know the devil of a time doing flesh tones and making anything look real that was supposed to be real. You know, I'll paint you a creature from the Black Lagoon, but I can't get you know Barbarella to look like Barbarella. Yeah, sure, uh, sure. things like that. But you know, also back then, really good figure kits weren't that easy yeah. to find. You could find a Godzilla kit. You could find, you know, uh, a, like I said, a creature from Black Lagoon. But they didn't have... This was pre any experience with, like, resin kits. Hmm. This was what Aurora or Monogram was putting on the shelf. And it wasn't until I started going to model shows that I even found out about wow. resin kits. So these guys, of course, uh, it's it's kind of... Kitty wing, kitty in a in a sweet shop. It's there's so much to to sort of choose from. Um, even if you just look at the sort of fantasy and sci fi uh, genre on its own, um, that seems to have exploded. Yeah, yeah really. I, I guess I guess I guess in Star Wars, uh, I guess since the seventies, um, that you kind of trace it back to that, and then it just exploded and it's continued as a genre. Well, I think it's generational. I think it's the people that didn't get to find those kits back then are now in control of making the kits. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. now they're making the kits yeah. they could never find yeah. when they were kids. It's like, you can get a darn good X-Wing kit these days. Back then, the, M the original NPC X-Wing kit was a bit dodgy at best. Remember? Yeah. Fit, whatever. Yeah. But now it's like, well, it's, it's not just the models, but it's the toys. When I was a kid, I wanted a good phaser and a communicator. Could never find a good Star Trek communicator. But now you can get toy communicators that are better than the actual props ever were as far as the look and the quality and the things they do and all of that. I think it's just generational in the, in the fact that the people who are making decisions as to what toys get made are the ones that are our age that oh, yeah. wanted those that, that, that came over uh, with uh, with James uh, absolutely didn't yeah. it, from uh, from Agora. I mean, he's a fan. He's not he's not a businessman who went into modeling as a business. Um, yeah, it kind of it was the other way around. It was a case of um, I I'm a model maker. I want to see uh, you know Super Snake as a kit, and now I have the opportunity to make that as a kit. And I think other people will think think it's a great kit as well. Um, so it's an interesting. It's an interesting way that uh, the people in charge with, I guess, the people that are putting out the best kinds of kits are also fans. I think you can tell if, if they aren't. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. You know? I, will, I, will, I will give you a, an example on the modeling side is 2001. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are so many good 2000 model, 2001 yeah. models. that Who in their right mind would say this is a great business decision? To put out a model from a sixty-year-old plus yep. movie, that of of a ship that has two minutes of screen time, Indeed. and it's forgotten. Yep. But you know, there is a fan base for that kit, and you know, God love them for doing it. They're doing the Lord's work. Wow. Well, I've had the uh, I've had the pleasure of um, experiencing Lou's models in person and seeing. The mm, museum see. that you've got there, Lou, it's absolutely amazing. <laughs> uh, I've got to ask, what do you think at the moment from all your time of building models, what's the most intricate or difficult model you've done? Well, the one that needed the most different skill sets. Oh, boy. Um, either the big enterprise, mm -hmm. because that I had to learn how to mix automobile paint. <laughs> Uh, and use big sprayers. And, you know, there was also a wood component in that. I had to make a wooden jig, to, you know, to build the thing, uh, plus the lighting, plus the, you know, the body work and the 
working with fiberglass and all that kind of stuff on that's on one end and on the other end you know the answer Wayne. yeah is that time oh wow god well, tell me about <laughs> it <laughs> okay. we did learn a lot of new things i mean i was learning new things all the time then i've never done an arduino program like that before i've never done the uh the resin fill that we did by tracing wires through resin i've never done that before it's uh It'll turn, turn and, right, okay. and, yeah, three, and yeah. 3d printing yeah. and you have to learn yeah. the 3d printing aspect of it um i like to think of myself as a as a problem solver hmm. and if i can find I, I won't say i'm the laziest person i know but i'm <laughs> darn close uh i i like to work smart and not hard yeah. so if i could find a quick solution to something i'll spend you know an hour and a half to fix a five minute problem yeah. because if i have that five minute problem i know a bunch of other people have had that five minute problem Absolutely. And that's how the whole yeah. that's how the whole masking thing yeah. came apart is 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 me kind of trying to find a solution to something that I know is going to be a sticking point mm. for a lot of other people. Now, where do you stand with, um, I, I guess, the whole sort of part work community and how that, I guess, connects with standard uh, plastic kits? Um, I've had conversations with people who are from very, very different backgrounds. They have no, no experience, no background in model making at all, but they will build a, a part work kit. Um, and likewise, people that build part works, either they gravitate towards uh, plastic kits eventually, or they don't. Um, for some, it seems to be a brick wall in between the two. And for others, there's kind of osmosis, I guess, between the two. Um, I kind of where, where do you kind of stand with that? Do you find that the you know the part work uh, kits themselves it's just a different kind of building because we're all makers it just gives you a um obviously a, a, a very high quality finished model when you're when you it's complete but it just doesn't involve the um I, I guess the amount of work involved for a plastic kit and i guess that's the attraction for non-model makers i guess we call them well i'm a babe in the woods when it comes to part works i have experience of exactly <laughs> two wow <laughs> <laughs> Two. Well, no, three, three, uh, because uh, here's here's my my problem with it's not a problem. Here's my issue with part works. I have no patience. So the uh, the the discipline of the discipline of waiting six yep. weeks, four weeks yep. for your next set of parts. Yep. That to me is that's no bueno. That yep. is if I if I only did that. I would go mad. It is the fact that that's an that's an add on to what I'm also doing with regular models that makes it bearable. <laughs> now I will, but I will say I will say that in the last, I don't know the entire history of part work models, but it seems to me up until what two three years ago it was ships, planes, automobiles. Yep. It was more of your typical yep. IPMS yep. subject yep. matter. When they start getting into Batmobiles and Ecto ones right. and Robo and Robocops and Transformers and things like that, that automatically opens up the uh, the the whole idea to a whole new audience of people who may not have wanted to build a Shelby Cobra as beautiful a car yeah. as that is. They may not have any had it had, had any interest in doing that. Now, what I like about part work builds what i really respect about it is it's a limited tool set mm -hmm. you don't have to have an airbrush you don't have to have a 3d printer you don't have to have you know a get uh, respirators and, mm -hmm. and ventilators yeah. and everything True. else that you need you don't have to ha i mean a screwdriver an allen key you're golden yep. you're pretty much there and you know a couple a couple triple a batteries now the bad, ex I'll tell you the one bad experience I had, and that was uh, building the R2. Hmm. Uh, was because of that arcane battery system <laughs> that they used. Right. You know, all the world over, you can get nine volt batteries. You can get double A batteries. I don't know why they picked this thing. We that you that have to, yeah. Yeah. You know, wow. sacrifice. <laughs> you have to sacrifice a chicken at an altar to get it to work. <laughs> But other than that, I, I but I really like I really like the the process of it. But I'll tell you uh, what happened with that was that I had found a gentleman 
on one of the, uh, I think it was on our RPF. He had the entire set mm. and I, I bought all of his parts from him at <laughs> yeah. once. Yeah. So yeah. I was able to sit down yeah. and do, I, I did like 10 stages a night for 10 days and I finished, you know, ran through it and it was done. And I had the best time putting that thing together until it, you know, tried to make it work. If I was waiting six weeks for each, you know, four weeks for each part, I, I'd have had a lot different uh, opinion of it. So, so how is your setup at the moment then, Lou? With your, with because the way I figure it, that you you you, you treat your model building kind of like a job because you tend to have the weekends off. You do you give yourself certain hours that you work through during the day? Because I think you do five days, don't you, of model building? I uh, yeah, I, I don't. I, I treat it like a job. Yeah, I um, I'm usually up and I start around nine in the morning. I you know, get up, get my coffee, listen to the radio. I, I start around nine, unless I've had some, you know, an itch <laughs> in the middle of the night that I've got, Oh, I figured out how to do this. And then I'll start earlier. And, and then I generally work till about four. And uh, unless I'm in a groove and yeah. then I'll go on into the evening, but uh, then that's, I'm, I'm filming as I go for the week's video. And that is my uh, yeah. sanity because once I retired, I needed to put myself on a routine so that I didn't, you know, turn into one of these guys on the couch with a remote and, you know, that's all you do all day. Yeah. Uh, so I put myself on a routine. I don't, I don't do it as a job as in I am paid to make videos like Wayne is. Or I don't spot my my uh, site is not monetized, so I don't garner anything from that other than sharing what I'm doing with other people. Now, it it, it is ironic that most of my builds don't involve my painting templates. Some of them do, but most of them don't. But if I'm doing something that uses a painting template, then yes, I profit from that because that helps the templates to sell. But other than that, that's not the, that's not the purpose of. The and for all those all those listening, Lou Dalmasso is the he's the face behind the Aztec dummy masks. Um, I've got to ask regarding those masks, Lou. Do you have to actually build the model and then create the masks as you're building, or do you complete the model and then make the masks afterwards? I have to. It, well, it depends on how the model goes together. But yes, yeah. I have to, particularly because when I am doing my instructions. I take pictures of the model I am building and painting as I am yeah. building it so that I can put those in the instructions for it. But yeah, unlike, uh, I used, I, I have a, uh, a, a uh, let me say it, a brotherly jab relationship type with uh, Paul over mm -hmm. in Paragraphics because Paul makes the photo etch, but he will make the photo etch, put it on the unpainted part and say, oh, I'm done. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah. Okay, uh, but I yeah. also have to paint it on top of that, yeah. you know, or people who design lighting, uh, Ralph will or design lighting, and he puts it in an unpainted kit. It's like, well, yeah, it's easy to light your kit if you're not painting it and building it. You have to actually glue it into the part yeah. and see how it relates to the other part. I mean, Lou, that, that is a skill in itself. I mean, like today I was doing the, the cap for Vincent, the Vincent from the black hole that I've been doing, yeah. and I had to mask that off myself. I yeah. still get paint. Under them, I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but oh, that, yeah. that's a, that, and that's yeah. a big piece. You're doing intricate yeah. little tiny windows and stuff like that. I just cannot fathom the the skill and artistry that must go into actually be able to create that. Well, it's, it's that it's that thing you do something ten thousand times. Practice, practice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The, four, the first five thousand, the first yeah. five thousand go by in a blur. But you know, we you do something ten thousand yeah. times, you become an expert. <laughs> well, of course, that's that's the that's the thing about the hobby, isn't it? It's, uh, it, it is that um, no one's born um, knowing how to hold an airbrush, for instance. Um, you know, it's it's yeah. it's that thing about it, it. It is absolutely practice, practice, practice. Um, when we all look at um, maybe some guys in say uh, say Europe, some of these uh, you know elite uh, figure painters, and you know we we kind of aspire to to their kind of level of skill. Um, I, I certainly I do, and the diorama builders, uh, some of some of the guys out of Spain, are it's amazing, um, and Japan and Germany. Um, but I think for the hobby, it's it's don't look at that as um, uh, don't get depressed about that. Because you know, you will improve the more you do this, and the more you the, yeah. every single kit 
you will get better. And I, I absolutely, I mean, I only mean back in the hobby for what, uh, under two years. Um, and the first kit was atrocious. Uh, but the last kit was, was okay, uh, I thought. Yeah. And I thought, yeah, I learned a lot about masking and all the rest of it over time. I've never held an airbrush mm-hmm. since I was, what, 12. Um, then it was an old badger with a can of compressed air. That's what that was. A, that was an airbrush then in the seventies. Um, so all this new stuff that I'm getting uh, my sort of head around. I mean, do you do you find that as well, Lou? That um, the the hobby itself, the amount of tools, the amount of um, I guess help that's out there now with uh, you know paint formulas, etc. Um, does that make your head explode, or does that make you kind of really want to try this stuff because it's solving problems which we may have had a few years ago or even decades ago i think that there are sometimes you can get so overwhelmed by the choices yeah. of what you can That's do exactly what i felt that yeah. you end you end you end up paralyzed what do you start and yeah. i do everything i do everything i do with like three brushes one airbrush and one bottle of paint and it's like i can't I, my brain can't handle, but you know, but so many different techniques. Yeah. But I want it reminded me of what I wanted to say when you started talking about it. my worst class when I went to art school. My worst class was airbrush. Right. I could not stand the the idea of of mix 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 yep. mass 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 mix mix mix. <laughs> One little spray, yeah. and then you take all the masking yeah, yeah, off, yeah. and then you mix up, yeah. the, and then you clean the brush oh, out. Yeah. Like all of that. Yeah, yeah. For one I'm still doing that. Spray. Now what? Do I, <laughs> that's, and, that's, well, that's my life. And then if, <laughs> if if that instructor could see me now, and that's my life. <laughs> that, that is my life. Yeah, yeah. yeah because everyone, yeah. everyone does that. I, mean, I, I am in awe of people that uh, still do brush painting, and it's as good as airbrush. Mm-hmm. Um, how they do that, I have no idea. I have no clue how they get that kind of finish uh, without an airbrush. It is, it is, it to me, it, it all comes down. What's the best, quickest, least fussy way mm. to accomplish your goal? Yeah. Sometimes it's with an airbrush. Yeah. Sometimes it's with a hand brush. And uh, just because you have the three D printer or the hair or the fancy airbrush, that doesn't mean it's the best solution. Well, of and, course, uh, I, I, I think that's right. I mean, you, uh, I mean, the kind of kits you put together as well, of course, you you often put uh, electrics in these things. So that's, that's yes. problem solving as well, which uh, I think is is very interesting. Um, but I think it's it seems to me to be a quintessentially American thing, American modelers. Uh, I'm sure when you see a kit, instantly you're thinking, how can I like the kit? Um, what would that look like? But in this country, in the UK, not so much. I mean, I uh, I got uh, to my yeah. local IPMS uh, group, and uh, I think the first kit I bought in with some lights uh, in it made the head explode. How do you do that? No one does this. No one does this. Um, and I and I I thought everyone did that, but I think I was kind of conditioned yeah. by watching YouTube videos by American uh, modelers, and I thought everyone did that. And actually, it seems to be a quintessentially American thing. I didn't I didn't notice that myself, Dave, until we uh, I went to Wonderfest this year, and Lou was actually yeah. uh, helping run an Iwata course where he was doing masks, and the guy sitting next to me already had a lighting kit for the Miranda, and I'm like, what? And he was putting yeah. it in straight away. Yeah. I'm like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. yeah. Well, to, to me, it's uh, it's it's the subject. Mm. If you're going to build a falcon and not light the back of it, what are you doing? I mean, the falcon is all about yeah. that big light yeah. at the back, yeah. and it's you know you could you could skimp on the paint, you could skimp on the construction, you could do all that kind of. But if you don't put a light in the back of that thing, you know, hang it up. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I think that's I think that's right. Um, it, it's uh, I mean, my group often asks me when I bring a kit in that has no light. Oh, where's the lights? Well, I don't do. I don't light everything. Yeah. If it's not appropriate, or I don't feel it's going to right. add anything to the kit, then I won't do it. I I, I won't do that. Yeah. It has to fit the kit. It has to yeah. bring something to the model. Well, now the thing is, everybody's putting sound in there. Yes. Yeah. And it has to have sound, and it has to have, you know, and that's something the part work people were good yes. at. They put the light. They put the right. the engine sound in, right. or they put the horn sound yeah. in. The Robocop has the voice clips in it. Optimus Prime is supposed to have voice clips in it. I mean, that's that's what makes it. But fun. then you've got the uh, the Doomsday Machine that you did this year, 
with the sounds. <laughs> well, that's that's the thing. That's well, that that's that's what you were saying, David, about appropriateness. To me, the Doomsday Machine. If you don't do that music, yeah. What are you doing? You got, I mean, that's, yep. that's like doing a, that's like doing the shark yeah. from Jaws and not doing the music. I mean, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Cause I'm going to build, uh, the, um, uh, you know, the Ghostbusters you know, car that, uh, put mm-hmm. lights in it, but without the, without the music, without, you know, without the theme music, that's going to look yeah. very, very odd for mm-hmm. me. So it has to have sound. Well, see, it has to. Here, here's, here's, here's your definition or here's your difference then. Uh, the Ecto one, without lights mm-hmm. is dead. Yep. But if you were going to build Christine, you've got to have this, you've got to have the yep. radio plan. Yep. They, you've got to have the songs coming out of the, because yep. that's the uh-huh. character. I've Although I didn't spend a lot of time explaining <laughs> what that is. <laughs> so why has it got lights, et cetera, yeah. <laughs> which is, which is strange. Um, I also wanted to ask you as well, Lou. Um, I mean, I've, I've obviously I've seen your workshop because uh, Wayne obviously did a walk around and you, when you, when you were there, Wayne, um, how do you actually organize that? I, I believe it's one space in your in your home, um, but of course, a lot of us. Uh, I've got a. I'm lucky. I've, I mean, I've also got a purpose built office or a, a sort of shed out the back. That's that's where I do mine. But a lot of people, it's when I was a kid, it was a, a tea tray and the shoebox for my tools, and that was it. Uh, so I've kind of uh, I'm, I've kind of got big boys toys with with what I'm doing at the moment. But for a lot of people, it, it's it's um, it's how do you build a, a useful space? Really, I mean, I'm assuming. The space that you have now isn't the one you started out with. I'm, a, I'm assuming that's that's evolved over time. Well, I've managed to keep it all under one roof. <laughs> it's a pretty it's a, big roof, it's a big roof, though. Yeah, let's say that. Yeah, I uh, no, I there are at any given time there could be parts of models, sub assemblies strewn about the entire ca- strewn about its cave, strewn about <laughs> the entire Everywhere. house. The bones of full 50 men. <laughs> so what's your most comfortable thing that you're, you you like building, Lou? Like time periods or genres or stuff like that? Where where do you find your comfort? Um, I like building my yeah. Trek models. <laughs> I like building my Star Trek models. I like building um, uh, just that. I'm, I, I like my Star Wars, don't get me wrong. I like the clean lines and the smooth, the smooth rounded curves of a nice, you know, a nicely for a nicely designed nacelle as opposed to a, you know, I, I'll tell you, I'm not really big on the alien yeah. aesthetic. Okay. Uh-huh. Where it's just plating for plating's mm-hmm. sake. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would much rather do something that harkens back to 2001 or, Star Trek or the 60s bit century modern uh-huh. design. I do like it. Yeah, because I think they came, they came, they kind of came out of the, I guess they were looking at how, what would spaceships look like? And I guess they looked at submarines and they were sleek and that, that kind of thing. And that's where the aesthetic for 2001, I think, came from. It was, let's put sort of things like submarines in space. That and the like, uh, the Art Deco robot design. Mm. Of of uh, Metropolis or yep. Forbidden Planet yep. or Lost in Space that that just that uh, gr- there's a great movie uh, Sky Captain and the World of Tomorrow <laughs> yeah. that is nothing but Art Deco robots and ray guns it's it's a beautiful aesthetic. that's what missed people buy that film I've I've got that film I had to rewatch it again last year but it's a great film it's a uh... Yeah, good mm-hmm. film. Well, there's that. I think these days, uh, I, I guess, well, yeah, model companies. That's what they do. They they trawl, um, you know, g- the genre for what what could we do next? You know, what uh, what 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 could uh, what could the actual you know, model making community want? But of course, often they 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 will not look at obscure stuff. Um, so I specific, I suppose for for you, Lou, what what kind of kit would you have loved to have built, but it just doesn't exist? Uh I would love to build the Orville. It doesn't, it doesn't exist. exist. Yeah, I would love to build a uh, Firefly kit. Doesn't it's exist. Crazy. Uh, <laughs> and, and and a lot of it's licensing. It's course. it's it's problems that you and I have no control over. Um, you know, maybe someday that'll get straightened out. But you I know, think that's probably one of the big big impetus or what, one of the big reasons why there's such a big influx now of the garage kit scene because there's things you just cannot get yeah. hold of, which. Uh, an amazing models that you see at some of these these shows and yeah, stuff, yeah. and it's like uh, it, it's scarce, 
is it, it ticks all the boxes. Well, and and with the with the proliferation of three D machines, that's only going to get more and more and more. I mean, I I don't try to understand the business end of that kind of stuff. Um, maybe you know, maybe it doesn't make financial sense for a model company to invest in, um, you know, an, a a uh, a model of something that's from a failed TV show, but <laughs> well, you can't it, you, you you can't call Firefly a failed TV show. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I was I was not saying that particularly. I mean, you name you name your well. I, no, I, I don't want to. I, I don't want to tell that story because I don't have the right to. Do and if I, if I tell it wrong, I'll get in trouble. You heard it here first, guys. Um, <laughs> uh, but but if you're going to build, if you're going to spend time and money in research and development on a model kit, make sure your subject doesn't get blown up in the first season. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm gonna say. Crazy Christ. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> I wonder what that was. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you did not hear it from me. Uh, no, and um, I was in exactly the same uh, uh, frame of mind. Uh, I think a lot of people had finished the kit uh, just just before they watched that episode. I went, oh, <laughs> fantastic! Uh, so it doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, but yeah, but it's it's here's my here's my version. It's a it's a handful of <laughs> here's a, a handful of sand. Here's my version of that. I have not stopped Bandai from continue to put out uh, you know, different uh, versions of the the kit. Uh, I think I think there's a there was a new one this year. Um, you know, the smaller one, one forty four. Um, so you, it, it's it's still being sold. People still want to build it. Yeah. Um, but it's it's one of those. Yeah. It's it's if there's something that you would like to try and build, then you're right. I mean the uh, you know the advent of 3D printing. Uh, you probably find somebody out there who's has built the STL for somewhere, probably. Um, and yeah, you know, either get that printed yourself. I, I, I mean, I've done that. I've, uh, you know, downloaded the SDL file and again, set that off to an, an, you know, to a bureau and got the thing printed for me um, until I can, uh, it, and, until I can't invest in my own machine. So there's always that route. If you, if you want to, to build something fairly obscure and someone's actually done the work. Yeah. Well, and to make sure that that person's been compensated. Yeah, absolutely. Too. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, it is a route. If you, if you do see something that you want to want to actually build, um, I think these days it's more about how you can modify things, um, particularly the diorama builders. Uh, those guys are using 3D printing a lot uh, for modifications and for building uh, stuff that they simply mm -hmm. can't buy. Or what they can buy either doesn't, doesn't fit or it's, uh, it's too expensive. Uh, you, know, you can get that stuff uh, you know, built, uh, you know, built, your, uh, built yourself. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you as well, I mean, you guys obviously collaborate on, on several several models. Is that something you've always uh, done, Lou? Is that uh, something that's come, uh, come along? Because uh, model making is essentially a, a pretty do-it-yourself uh, hobby, isn't it? That's very, that's very new for me. I'm, I am very much of the opinion that uh, I, I love to sit around and chew the idea over with Wayne or with other mm. people about okay what does this model need to do what oh we could do this so, but after i get started it's like He's don't touch my model <laughs> get away from me <laughs> yeah. it's like back away I'm, from no, my I'm model doing, yeah. oh i think you should, yeah <laughs> somebody says well i think you should paint that blue well i think you should shut up and mind your own business <laughs> 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 yeah. it's like i i have a heart i mean that's what i i don't know if that's why i'm drawn to doing the models the way i'm doing it's like because it is a solitary thing. Yeah. I can't imagine, I, I can't imagine, uh, you know, the masters painters in the Renaissance going, oh, what do you think about this wonderful uh, sculpture? Or what? Oh, I think if you chip like this, yeah. it, no, get away yeah. from me. Yeah. It is yeah. good. That was apparent well, when we did the time machine challenge as well, because we knew what we wanted mm. to do. We knew how we had to do it, but we all yeah. did our own things yeah. <laughs> when it comes yeah. to actually yeah. making the yeah. thing spin. And it was, uh, it was interesting to see how you tackle your own things. It, it it's different routes to the same destination, yeah. but I don't I don't I don't want to hand off the stuff. You know, I don't. There are people I know that oh, let's do a buddy build. Well, what's a buddy build? Yeah, what, oh, that's where I start a model and I hand it off to somebody else, and then they work on it for a little bit, and then they hand it off to somebody else. It's like that sounds stupid. Yeah, that's, <laughs> where's my model? Yeah, that's, that's never gonna. Yeah. That's never gonna work. 
never, <laughs> never. Do you, well, what if they screw it up? You know. <laughs> Do you realise that it was only last year because the, the wow. years seem to be going by. Last year was my first ever Wonder Fest, and then obviously this mm. year was my second one. And uh, mm. to me, I mean, this year seems to have grown since the year before, big time that we actually noticed the video that I put on my channel has now had something like 170,000 views, which is easily mm. the highest amount of views on, on my channel, big time of any video. Now we keep saying that we need to see a wonder fest in the UK because we do have Indeed. that sort of um, following here. And the only way Indeed. we can get to see it is if we go over to America, but uh, obviously Lou, you've been experiencing it for years. So you knew about this, you knew about the competition and how people can show off their models and stuff like that. And you've yeah. been entering your <laughs> own models. Yeah for a long time as well is that right so, so yes. do you do yes. you make uh, conscious decisions when you're building models that this is going to be a competition entry or is it something that you built a model and you thought this will be good in a competition it's it's kind of i i assume i'm going to take everything <laughs> and then a month before i go oh no this is good enough. this is good enough. this is good <laughs> and i would i would have down to about 10 and then after that i was like uh no, no. <laughs> I had I, Wayne. You know this. I had kits in the in the hotel yeah. room last year that I didn't bring down yeah. to the table wow. because yeah. because uh, I kind of saw where, every, where everyone else now, was. I, yeah. My when I when you see the level of everybody else's, yep. it's like okay, maybe yep. not this one. And I also I it's maybe ego. I try to bring something that somebody else, nobody else yeah. is going to bring. Mm -hmm. I can almost guarantee you that nobody else was going to bring no. a doomsday machine. And out. even that studio yeah. set of the uh, Galileo shuttle. Yeah. 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 Now that was something I said, Oh, this is going to Wonderfest. I'm going to be happy with this, but no, I don't try to, to uh, I don't try to build with the idea of entering it in a competition yeah. in mind. Um, but I don't also, I don't want to be the, I don't want to be the sixth guy there with a Frankenstein model. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Or, the year that the, the the first year that the um the 22 inch eagle 1999 eagle came out round two brought out this beautiful kit still one of the best kits they've ever mm -hmm. done the 22 inch basic eagle and i'm going okay i bet you there's going to be 20 of these <laughs> things at the competition but do i still want to bring it it's like well yeah I, i'm happy i'm proud of the job i yeah. did I, and i brought it and there was maybe two or three others but sometimes you can just psych yourself out thinking, oh, every, everybody's going to bring that. And it turns out nobody mm -hmm. does. And or you can say, I bet you no one's going to bring this in. 20 people yeah. do. It's like, yeah, it, it, you can you can be your own worst enemy sometimes. So I just try to say, OK, is this something I'm proud of? Is this something somebody else might not have seen elsewhere? Is this, you know, special no. enough? And uh, for me, it's like, oh, I'm happy with how I solved this problem on that kit. Yeah. Or I'm proud of the thing I added to this kit. And uh, that's what determines whether. Or I, not I think I'm that's right it. because um, I think if you chase, if you chase the awards, if you chase the trophies, um, you could be a basket case very, very quickly. Because if you don't win or you don't get placed, after yeah. year after year after year. All you're going to be doing then is building models to try and win that award or to try and get placed or, or whatever it is. And that's not really what the hobby's about, it seems to me. Um, you, you you would very, very no, quickly I don't think so. get very, very depressed because if, you know, if you're not winning for whatever the reasons are, and it might not be because the model isn't very good, because I'm assuming, just like IPMS in the UK for Scam Model World, it's, it's a very subjective thing. You know, the judges on the day uh, make a decision. And it may not go your way for, exactly. for years, and that that could really you know, do a, do something rather nasty with your mental health if you want to if you're going to try and pursue that. So I think if you if you just build the stuff for yourself, and if a, ha a competition happens to tick round, put the put it in, and uh, you might uh, you might actually uh, you know, win something or get placed. But I, I, I don't think I could recommend. I like it when know, building for competitions just themselves. That's that's not what the hobby's about. Yeah, I like it when somebody says, "Oh, I saw that that X thing that you built. Mm. I liked how that turned." To me, that's that's good. Yeah. That's uh, because I don't know what weird thing it is about it, but models always look better in person than they do with photographs. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, the detail um, just doesn't go. David, David, to tell you the truth, the thing about Wonderfest is lately, the last few years, it's been getting your model down in time so you can get to the yeah. power. <laughs> it's like there's, there's a limited number Jeez. of power jacks really? and all that wow. and, and yeah. power strips. And it's like, if you have a kit, you had better, it, it has lighting. You had better get down there early, or else they're going to snap up all. Oh ah, well, I'll get around that. All, all of my and... uh, uh, independent battery powered um, USBs. So mm -hmm. I just leave the USB on the table, and then just I'll just come back every mm -hmm. probably every six hours and change the batteries. <laughs> so just to, That's the only way to do it. Yeah, just to keep it going. Um, but um, Wonder Wonderfest started as a response to IPMS mm. because of. Yeah. To, because the people who build the fantasy kits yeah. were not being yeah. represented yeah. At, at IPMS. It's so, better now than it was. Uh, Absolutely. Maybe yeah. a natural. Yeah. yeah. And maybe, maybe that'll be a natural outgrowth of Telford is that it splits off into a Telford IPMS and a Telford mm -hmm. fantasy. I'd love Possibly. To see that. Yes. We're, we're thinking about that a lot. I think, uh, um, as I, mm -hmm. I, as I, when I came back from the garage show, um, that's uh, that sort of sparked my interest. Uh, again, it was specialised, you know, quite a small small event, but again, it's all fantasy and, and science fiction horror. Um, but you can kind of see that on a larger scale because there's a few dotted around, and there's no reason why they can all come together into one place, um, really. Mm -hmm. um, so it's an interesting uh, concept uh, to do some kind of Wonderfest UK. Really, it's uh, it is it's uh, it's something we're uh, we're I think we're going to start seriously thinking about um, as a as a possible thing for uh, for, for Wayne and mm -hmm. I if we can actually get that off the ground if it's possible. Um, but it's it's kind of a perfect storm. I think sci-fi fantasy is big enough now. Um, if you, stuff across TV and film, it's still uh, still growing. So I think the the kit manufacturers are paying attention to it as well. Part workers, of course, uh, they are paying very much attention to that. Lots and lots of genre stuff. So um, I think there's there's plenty of interest out there. Um, it's just uh, if we can get that all get all together in one place and uh, you know get to get enough people there so, so to come along. Okay, I've got an I've got a question for you, David. Then what would you think of somebody who entered a part work? in a show that'd be fine for me i do not distinguish between part works and um plastic kits uh, i know people that poo poo uh part works they say oh that's not that's not model making oh, that's that's oh, it's just not that's not that's not model making at all it isn't i have absolutely no problem with that at all we did not, we did see whatsoever. some of wonderfest there was an r2 there last year i think and the, the falcon was mm. there this year mm. but they, they were, were heavily yeah. modified I think the, the R2 so is weapon. If I'm, the, uh... well, that's fine as well. Yeah. The, the, if you, Whatever you want to do. If you want to, again, it's exactly what you were saying yeah. earlier, Luke. If you uh, do want to bring a part work to a show like that, you might find there's going to be 15 R2s. But that's that's yeah. that's just the way it's going to be because 15 people probably built that and they want to bring it. And if they do, then the judge yeah. is going to have a very hard decision which is the best R2. Um, but again, that's a subjective thing on the day, really. Uh, it's That's what it is. But I think... Part works, plastic kits. It's all it's all making. You're all makers. Uh, you're building this stuff. So I have absolutely no problem with uh, mixing those two mm -hmm. together, which is what I do all the time. Um, I'm, I mean, I've, I've just finished a plastic kit. Uh, I'm going to go and finish my DeLorean next, so it's done, uh, and then I'll go back to a plastic kit next. Yeah. Uh, that's that's how I tend to you know to to do these kind right. of things, or have a couple of things on the go uh, at, uh, at in, you know uh, at a time. Not three or four like you, maybe, but uh, one or two is enough in my head. Uh, that's that's enough for me. But yeah, things like that. I think uh, I think we're we're edging towards I think a point where um, we we can do a wonder fest in the UK. I think that's I think that, that's absolutely uh, that's absolutely coming. Mm. Well, we're getting very close to the end there, Lou. Um, I guess what we'd like to ask you is um, what are you working on at the moment? What's next for you? Uh, what's what's uh, what's on the bench? What's on the bench is uh, that huge Tie Fighter kit right now right. that uh, has sparked a lot of discussion, mm -hmm. shall we say, on the site yeah, yeah. as far as how, how accurate it is or isn't, and, well. and is the pilot too small or is the pilot the right size? And a lot of times I realize, you know, you can make a kit that is completely accurate to the filming model, and people still won't yeah. believe you that uh, this is what the film perhaps the filming model had a defect in it that you weren't aware of. <laughs> That's true. You know? yes, absolutely. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I say, and I'll tell everybody, we are in a golden age right now of kits. 
you are getting quality kits from major manufacturers of subjects you maybe wouldn't thought would ever see the light of yeah, day. True. And um, it's and more are announced every week. And uh, I remember the dark days when you you know you go scan the shelves at the toy store yep. when they still carried models yep. that you didn't have to go to a hobby shop to find. But you go to the toy store and you know car models out the wazoo but you know try to find an enterprise or try to find a robot or something interesting for you and uh it just wasn't there and now it's everything at your fingertips Absolutely. whether it's a garage kit or somebody's 3d print or whatever it's like there's no excuse not to be out there building something well, I think that's a brilliant time to end uh, uh, on that uh, note, Lou. I think it's uh, yeah, it's yeah. I stole Phil's. I stole Phil's line for the last. Build, build something. something. <laughs> build something. Yeah, get out there and build something. Um, well, again, uh, thanks for for joining us uh, this time, uh, Lou. I think that's been a fascinating uh, conversation. Uh, I'm sure we'll touch base again uh, at some point, uh, some point in the future. Well, before moving on, I'd like to talk to you all about a company that we've been working with, Agora Models, the home of big scale modeling. Agora Models has transformed the world of scale modeling since they launched, largely due to the company promise. The Agora promise is designed to re-establish trust that once a new model has been launched, it will not stop production until every part of the kit has been produced. The Agora Advantage Club rewards customers, giving members early access to new models, but importantly, ensures the customer care experience is world class. Whether you want to build a museum quality car, iconic vehicle, or love sci-fi and fantasy, there is a model in the Agora range ready for you. With exciting new models coming this year, including the first of the James Bond collection, if you have always wanted to build a model, Agora Models invites you to join a massive community of fellow SCAR modelers. Visit agoramodels.com to discover their ever-changing range of museum quality models. Uh, well, uh, we've come to the uh, the end of this uh, this uh, episode. Uh, sadly, um, I'd like to thank uh, Lou for being our special guest and for giving us uh, all the insights into his model making. Uh, until next time, it's goodbye from me and it's goodbye from Wayne. Take care, everyone. See you later. The Scale Model World Podcast. <laughs>